What's up, Matrix? It is finally your time for Life Sciences. I am Luni, and joining me in studio is Aslam. Aslam, uh, how are you? Hi, Luni, how are you? <laughs> it's not their time, it's our time. <laughs> what are we doing for the mind sessions today? Today, we're just chatting. I told you the last yeah, time. Yeah, just. We're just chatting. Today, <laughs> we're doing the remainder of the environment, and uh, we're looking at community structure all right welcome back by the way because aslam was in the uk mindset is if you didn't know that he was traveling the world <laughs> anyway i hope you guys are having a great day and you're ready to learn more and learn extra with us don't forget to hit us up on twitter at learn extra our facebook page is facebook.com forward slash learn extra you can download all the notes the videos the schedules and check out what we have going on on learn extra today forward slash live thank you so much for tuning in and thank you to M macmillan for bringing us this great show so with all that said, I'll hand it straight back to Aslam. Thank you so much, Luni. Welcome, Mindsetters. And I'm hoping we are ready to go. I'm sure many of you across the country are actually busy with studying. I'm hoping in some provinces you're writing life science tomorrow or the next day so that it's relevant to you. Well, in Gauteng, that's not the case. Life science is written quite late, uh, 13th of September and the 15th, 16th of September, the Friday, the Monday. The rest of the country, I'm not sure when you're writing. Please let us know on the Facebook page as well when you're writing your paper one and paper two. But nonetheless, we are at the end of the curriculum, as we know it. Today marks the end, Luni, by the way, of yes. the curriculum. So grade 12s are done. That's right. In terms of curriculum, we would be, end, we would be done by the end of today. That means this is the last bit of environment stuff that uh, we're going to look at today. Good. Uh, I'm hoping that the mindsetters will also tune into the grade 11 for the last three weeks because then you would have a double dose on environment because if you follow closely, you'll see the grade 11 and the grade 12 stuff, a very similar work that is being done. So that is good. You're getting two different perspectives of the same work and you're getting two sets of questions from two different people in different ways. What more can you ask for? You have a choice in these things. All right, let's get right into it then. I said last week I like the blue. In this lesson, what do we do, guys? We're looking at symbiosis. And under symbiosis, we're looking at these three guys, parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. And this, guys, it should be a revision for you. Because you've done it in grade 8, you've done it in grade 9, and you may have done it in grade 4 or 5 as well. So this year, this is just a revision, that and a revision of that and taking it a step further. We also want to consider the debates on decisions to intervene and control community structures. Example, the culling of elephants. We'll talk about that as well. We also want to discuss the impact of human settlements on community structures. All these stories there. Then we want to consider the aesthetic value placed on South Africa's biodiversity by South Africans, you and I. Then we want to move to ecological succession, explain primary succession and secondary succession. Now guys, what we've done here is because we have covered parts of the culling of the elephants and the environment, when we spoke about ecological footprints, etc., it's a repetition of that. We focus more on the symbiotic relationship and succession today. Okay? So just bear with us on that. And these, we will have a discussion right at the end, again, on these things, just to think about how these things can be tested and of what value is it for you and me. Why was this put into the curriculum in the first place? Now, before we move forward, I want to go backward, and that is looking at the section called environment, and putting this structure into little packets of information that you needed to know. When we started with environment, we started with population ecology. And this dealt with population size, population numbers, what affects the size of the population. Then we went into human population, the different age, gender, pyramids, and the rest of it there. 
While we were talking about that, we were also talking about with our population increase as humans, how did we impact the environment? We spoke about it initially, that's why I said, what we're talking about, the culling of the elephants and so on and so on now is a different story. Remember, when we're talking of the culling of the elephants, there's no one fixed point of view. You can either be for the culling or you could be against it as long as you can back up your argument with what you are saying. So we started with that. From there we went to social structures. In social structures we looked at, for example, herds and flocks and we also looked at uh, division of labor in other words guys what we're saying is under these things what did we discuss how does this society of animals organize themselves so that they are effective okay and I'm not going to go into too much of, of detail there then we came now to community structures And under this section, we are looking at the relationships of organisms in the ecosystem. We start by talking about what is the relationship. In other words, we talk about a food chain, a food pyramid a food web, those are part of community structures. From there we move on to the different relationships that we find. Last week you may have looked at, for example, competition, intraspecific, interspecific competition, competitive exclusion, and then you may have also looked at uh, predation, as a relationship between a predator and a prey and the graph that shows you the oscillating relationship between the predator and the prey. You may have also looked at uh, the resource partitioning. That means how organisms can live together in the same environment but have different requirements so that they do not interfere with each other, that they can coexist without competing with each other. One is feeding at the bottom, one is feeding in the middle, one is feeding higher up, etc., etc., etc. And that brings us to where we are today, and that is the symbiosis, 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 and finally, succession. And I told you that little bit of the human impact that we have that pervades the whole topic. It starts there at the beginning with population, moves on into uh, social and now in uh, the community structures and how we, you and me, Looney, me, you, you, you and you as well, how we all impact on these things. But it's not a big chunk of the work that we are talking about. The two important things that come out in our structure is the elephant culling and a rhino poaching, also big in our story. Also the little bit of deforest deforestation that we are now taking away uh, forests for our purposes, etc. You can talk about that because that's linked to ecological footprint, which we have discussed already. So that is where we are in reality. So let's get right into it. The first topic that we said we're going to discuss today is symbiosis. Symbiosis. Sim together. Bios, living or life. Biosis. So, symbiosis means living together. Not with your boyfriend or girlfriend. That's not what we're talking <laughs> about. And that, Looney, is not symbiosis. <laughs> we're talking about in the ecosystem. It's the interaction between two different organisms. Or we can say between organisms of different species. We can change that around as we wish just to get an understanding. Living together for some reason. And this living together will have different effect on each one of them. And what we're going to explain as we go along 
is what is, this differ- what is this difference that we are talking about. So we start straight away with parasitism. And this parasitism, guys, I start with this deliberately because as teenagers especially, you like to say to your brothers or your sisters or your friends, stop being a parasite. Yes, Luni? Yes. Stop being a parasite. <laughs> now, when do you do that? You do that when they keep taking from you all the time and you're losing, yes? Somehow you're losing. You're giving off yourself all the time. So you're losing. I, I, I need a pencil. So give them the pencil. Pencil never comes back. Come back next day. I need a pencil. Here's another pencil. Your pencil goes away. doesn't come back. So you say, stop being a parasite. Now let's see how that applies in nature. It's a symbiotic relationship in which one organism benefits. So one organism benefits. Which one? The parasite. The parasite benefits. And the other is harmed. Which one? The host. So the host is harmed and the parasite benefits. Straightforward story. One is benefiting, the other one is harmed. So you need to be able to give that definition and naturally thereafter provide some or more examples of this. And you need to be able to say in your examples what's happening. And this from your grade 11 work, tinea solium or tapeworm and man or tapeworm and pig or tapeworm and cattle, sheep, whatever, wherever the tapeworm is found. What is the story there? The tapeworm is a parasite that lives off these different hosts that I mentioned. It gets food, shelter, space, etc. from these organisms, so that is the benefit. And at the same time, it's causing the organism that is hosting it to lose food and other stuff, and it may even cause illness in that particular organism by blocking the intestinal structures or by being lodged in different parts of muscles or in vital organs like the eye or the brain, causing problems there as well. And it can also cause meat to be not fit to be uh, used by humans not fit for human consumption. Measly pork, for example, in a pig, if it's found that it has tapeworm in it, this is labeled as measly pork, and it's not fit for human con- consumption because then it's going to infect man as well. So notice what we've done. We've spoken about the relationship uh, between these two organisms. Another one is here, ticks on animals. There you see the tick on an animal there, we're moving the head to show you the tick, and you see first of all there's an injury to that animal, this tick is getting blood from this animal. So the tick is getting food, so it's benefiting, the animal is being harmed because it's getting hurt, and losing blood, and losing nutrients, and the tick may come with infections from somewhere else to cause harm to that animal as well. Another one, a mistletoe on other plants, a mistletoe grows around other plants, sucking water and nutrients from those plants. Eventually those other plants dry up, dehydrate and die. So the mistletoe is benefiting in getting that and the other plant is losing out. So those are some of the examples. The next one deals with mutualism. Now this word, the English language is easier, mutual. You talk to your friends, you know what, I have a business proposition to you, for you, and it will be of mutual benefit to both of us. Already that word mutual means two. So it's a symbiotic relationship where both organisms benefit. Win-win situation. There's something in it for both parties. Okay? And the first example is given of lichens, there on top. Lichens you see on trees, etc. These lichens is a combination of algae and fungi. The fungi forms two layers on the outside and the algae is a sandwich in between. Why? Because the algae requires moist conditions to survive, so the fungi forming that layer protects the algae from dehydrating. At the same time, fungi do not have chlorophyll and algae has chlorophyll, so algae can manufacture its own food and this food can be passed to the fungi. So win, win. Fungi protecting, algae providing food. Another one is bacteria in the root legumes, uh, in the roots of legumes, leguminous plants, where we find bacteria. The bacteria get food from these leguminous plants, and in turn, they help to change nitrogen to nitrates, which the plants need for protein synthesis. 
So they're both benefiting there. And the famous, the bees and the, the, bees and the, and the birds, the insects and flowers, birds and flowers, where they get nectar from the flowers, and at the same time, they take pollen from that flower to another flower. So they help in pollination, and at the same time, they're getting nourishment from that. And with that, both benefit from both. Let me give you a benefit and hand you over to Luna. benefit. <laughs> Why is it as Aslam says he's going to give you a benefit? So let's take a very short break, and we'll see you straight after this. Welcome back, Mindsetters, from that very short break. I hope you guys got some water and you got some juice and you have your notes on you and you writing down everything Aslam is saying. Just to remind you, Stars and Education Awards are coming up and we want you to tell us about your favorite teachers and to enter them, guys. So remember that I will post the link on the Facebook page because it's too long. It's got PHPs and for slash numbers and all of that stuff. So I don't want to confuse you guys. I will post the link on our Facebook page. Enter your teachers, vote for them. Tell me about your favorite teacher, what's so amazing about them, how they've impacted your life and what they've taught you. Even like guys, if it, even if it's like personal stuff, your favorite teacher, enter them in f to stand a chance to win an award in the Stars and Education Awards. And I'll post all the information on our Facebook page. So with all that said, I'll take it straight back to Aslam. Get it back to me already? Yes. And I was waiting for you to speak for about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have that one question. Can you quickly yes. just take cool. Mangwai Mpati is asking, hey, I'm enjoying the show. What is the importance of symbiosis and what I impact does this have in the community? What is the importance of symbiosis? Yes. And what impact? What impact does it have? Mindset is I want you to note what I've just done on the board. There, was, there were two sentences there, right? Yes. Huh? Two questions, basically. What have I done? I have Some. highlighted the key words from there. This is a skill that you need to use when you are answering questions. What is it asking for? It's asking for the importance of symbiosis and the impact that symbiosis has. Now, first of all, on its own, symbiosis, we cannot talk of the importance of symbiosis on its own because we have these different types. And the one important that we can talk about is that the individual in a community is not an island, is not an isolated thing. The individual is living within an ecosystem among other community members. Therefore, there has to be a relationship between the different community members to make this ecosystem successful. Can you see that this work is not learning from a textbook? This work is understanding common sense. Somebody has to live together. Why do we need, why do we, you and I, Looney, wh whoever else is out there, why do we need other people? Because we are social beings. And because we are social beings, we depend on other people in our lives to help us with different things. So the same way animals depend on each other within their environments to live. So not all of them, some of them can carry on on their own, but the others are dependent. Some are holistically dependent on this relationship. Without this relationship, they, their existence will cease to exist. While others, the relationship is there, but if it doesn't happen, not so critical, they can carry on with their life. Okay? And the impact of symbiosis, it leads to a more successful community. Because there's an interaction between the different individuals in the community, this leads to a more successful community, which will be rich in biodiversity and will be rich in population as well. Are we happy with that? Any other questions? No, that was the only Good. question. Guys, post your questions, post your comments. We're waiting for your comments and questions because we're going to read your comments and your questions, not just your questions. Okay, we were still busy with symbiosis, and we spoke about mutualism, we spoke about parasitism. Now, commensalism is slightly different. Commensalism is a symbiotic relationship where one organism benefits, and the other neither benefits nor is harmed. So the one is benefiting from this relationship, the other one, no effect. It's not good, it's not bad. So this organism is continuing without any harm. And the examples are, 
barnacles and whales. The barnacles, as you can see, the white spots on the whale there, and in this case here, also some white spots on the whale as it lifts off. The barnacles, are, they get stuck onto the whale's skin. What's so good about that for the barnacle, Looney? It's getting a free ride. Free ride. Yeah, <laughs> taxi. No fare. Nothing. Don't have to do this <laughs> or that or anything else. It simply jumps onto this taxi, and this taxi takes it wherever it wants to. One. That's a benefit. So free transport. Secondly, look at the size of the barnacle. Little spots on this big, huge whale. The barnacle on its own is scared in the ocean. But if it's with the whale, well, ah, yeah. who's going to mess with me now? Come, bring it on. Right? So it's getting protection also from the whale because the other creatures are not going to come and eat it up because it's on the whale. And the whale is the, one of the largest structures in uh, largest organisms in the ocean. So that's the story there. And in the same line, we have this guy called the Ramora fish, there, and the shark, you know, the shark, jaws, yeah. So the sucker fish does a similar thing. It sticks itself on the body of the shark. And, and you can see it's a very small organism. It's not going to weigh down the shark in any way. It's not causing any harm to the shark. And at the same time, it's not benefiting the shark in any way. The same way the whale did not benefit or was harmed by the other relationship. So the shark is not benefiting, nor is it harmed. The Ramona fish, in the meanwhile, as the shark is feeding, the shark is a dirty feeder. It just bites and chunks, and some scraps will fall out. The Ramona fish can feed on the scraps that's coming there. And at the same time, it's getting a free ride. And at the same time, it's getting a free bouncer. It's getting protection. It doesn't need a bouncer. It does not have to pay a bouncer. It's got protection. Nobody's going to mess with me as long as I'm with the shark in the ocean. OK? Then we have in plants what we call epiphytes. Epiphytes are small little plants that can't get light in a forest. So what they do is they piggyback on larger plants. In other words, they grow on top of other plants so that they can go up in, in as high up as possible without growing tall. So the epiphytes receive sunlight and so on, and they do not harm the plant in, in any way. Where the, the plant that grows on top of the other plant harms the plant, and obviously once there's harm to the other plant, it moves away from commensalism and towards parasitism. So that's what we are saying there. Now. Uh, this question I put in as an essay to do two things. One is to teach us, you and me, how to answer an essay question. At the same time, it's testing us on the section that we've just done. Now let's look at the essay and analyze it. The essay says, using examples, da 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 da. Using examples, is there any verb in that first part? No. No verbs. Using examples. Describe, or there is actually to use. To use something is, is a verb there, to do something, use. But what do they mean, the main verb here? Describe. Now we're going to change color just for emphasis. Describe. What comes after the verb? Predation, competition, and symbiosis. Three things. What must you describe? You must describe predation, competition, and symbiosis. Three things that you have to describe. And how must you describe it? You must use examples while you're doing that. And what about it? What's the next verb? Explaining. Ah, let's use our color there. Explaining. It's another verb. Explain what? Explain how each interaction influences the population size of the organisms involved. So the emphasis is to discuss, or rather not discuss, to describe these things with an explanation of how they impact on the size of the population. Can you see what we are saying? Now, what did I do? I have highlighted the keywords. I've isolated the verbs. And whatever comes after ver the verb is what I must do. Describe what came after the verb, predation, competition, symbiosis. Those are the three headings that we have already. How must we do that? Explain 
how each of these interactions, which one, predation, competition, and symbiosis, influence the population size of the organisms involved. And do all of this using examples. So this is our structure of the essay. Now notice the essay is 20 marks, and generally in your paper it will say 17 for content and 3 for synthesis. That gives you your 20 marks. The synthesis is not a heading. It's not something that you have to write. The synthesis is put there for the markers. The markers will be given a guideline on how to assess your essay overall. It deals with the following. It deals with the correct terminology used. It deals with the amount or the depth of your answer. And it deals with the logical flow of your answer. Those are the three most important things that is going to be judged when you mark in an essay. But it's not your problem that as long as you follow that thing. Remember, 17 marks, a whopping 17 marks out of the 20 is given for what? Is given for the content that you're going to present. Enough said about that. Let's go into the answer and see how this answer was presented. All right. So normally I advise people to keep your answer in the sequence that was given in the question because that's how the memo will be normally set. So it's easy for the marker when he or she is marking your work. It's going to go through the same sequence. So if you keep it in that sequence, predation first, then competition, then symbiosis. Within that, you're going to give an example. You're going to exp describe it first, give an example, and you're going to then say how the, it affects population size. So there's three things to do. One is to describe the relationship. Two is to ex uh, give an example. And three is to explain how it influences population size. So you start with predation, for example. We're heading predation. What are you going to do? Ex describe what it is. Predation is where a predator captures and kills other animals for its food. Then we give an example. Lions that capture and feed on antelopes, zebras, buck, etc. All of that. Now, what can we say about the population size? Free population will decrease and the predator population will increase when this happens. This is very rudimentary, very simply put. It can go into more detail. We can talk about that there is an oscillating relationship between this, that each one checks the other one. When the prey population increases, the predator population increases. When the predator population increases, the prey population decreases. Competition, you'll notice it's not only dealing with what we said, but it goes beyond that. Competition, you talk about intraspecific competition or and or intraspecific. So you're going to explain that. You're going to give your example. And you're going to talk about what happens in the population size. We don't have to do all of that. Then you go to symbiosis. You first talk about the definition of symbiosis. And then you will say that there are three types. Parasitism and explain. And we've done that already. Mutualism and explain. And commensalism and explain. I'm only going to look at the last part in these cases. Parasitism, the host organism population size will decrease because it's dying. It's being harmed. And the parasite population will increase until obviously the, the host dies. When that host dies, then that par parasite population will have to decrease or find another host. In mutualism, because they are benefiting each other, the, both the populations will increase in this relationship. And in commensalism, the population of the organism that benefits will increase in size. The other one will not increase, nor will it decrease. It's just like there's no harm and no benefit, it's not going to, because there's no harm or benefit, uh, it's not going to affect its population size. So can you see how we've done that to get our 20 marks? The facts were given, they were given in a logical sequence, and we use correct biological terminology with examples. So can you see we did one? We gave the description, example, effect on that. We didn't talk of one, then the next, then the next, and then come back to the one, and the next, and the next. Do one, finish the idea, go to the next one, finish the idea, go to the last one, and finish the idea. And that is how you will benefit in that type of a, a story. We move on to succession. Succession simply means changes in a community over time. And all ecosystems 
undergo some form of succession. What type of successions do we have? We have primary succession, primary succession and secondary succession. We're going to look at each of these two types of succession, how they occur, what happens, what are the stages that they follow, and how it enhances development within the ecosystem. With that, Looney, it's all yours. All right, mindset is let's take a very short break. I'll check out all your questions for Aslam during the break, and we'll get back to them when we come back straight after this. Welcome back, Mindset is from that very short break. I hope you guys are still on part, Aslam, and you're learning more and learning extra with us. I see a lot of you have many questions to ask us, so I will get straight into them. So, Aslam, my son, Tony, is asking, is predation also a symbiotic relationship? What's the name there? Masana. Masana. Yes. Masana, no. Predation, as you see, as we've done in the essay, we have kept predation separate from that. It is a community uh, issue because predation affects the community, there's a relationship between that and that, but it is not a symbiotic relationship. In predation, we talk of one animal, the predator, which hunts, kills, and eats the other one, which is the prey, okay? So it's not a symbiotic relationship. Okay, cool. And then Lungile Koza, can you please explain case strategy species and R strategy species? Lungile, case strategy, and for uh, the benefit of the mindset is case strategy, case strategy, and R strategy. Where do they fit in our diagram that we made earlier? They both fit in population ecology for a start. It affects the population of a species. K strategy species, K is not, but we say K for care. What care? Parental care. Do care. All right. What care? Parental care. So K strategy species are those species which have a high, high degree of parental care. Therefore, they may have a low birth rate, low in comparison to R, right? Low birth rate, a low infant mortality rate. That means very few of the young will die because they've been taken care of by their parents and a relatively long lifespan. Now remember, when we talk of long lifespan, we talk in a natural case. Uh, if an accident happens, somebody knocks a bird over, a dog over, or something like that, it's a different story. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about in a natural environment. When we look at the R strategy species, there's a low degree of parental care. Or no parental care. As a result, because there's no parental care of these organisms, they generally have a high birth rate. In other words, they produce many offspring, but they have a high infant mortality rate. That means, and it's all very nice to write high infant mortality rate when you don't know what it means, Luni. Mm. You must understand what it means. And that's why I'm saying, which means that many of the young die early. Okay? High infant mortality rate. The infants are dying. And therefore, a low life, uh, uh, rather not, uh, we rather won't write it that way. We we'll say that because of that, not all offspring survive to adulthood. That does not mean that in case that the species all the offspring reach adulthood. We know in our own population of humans that we may have family members that have lost a child at 
one year old or two year old or five year old or a 10 year old or a scholar. We, heard, we hear of this all the time, accidents, disease, illnesses and so on. So, but a higher proportion will reach adulthood. Here, not all or rather many do not. That is why they lay many eggs, etc. high birth rate. Why? So that they ensure survival of the species. Simple as that. Okay, next question. All right. Matsoba Tefo is asking, so he's got two questions, so I'll combine them. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between holoparasite and semi-parasites? Right. And then he also asks, is parasitism a form of predation? That is similar to our first question, right? Okay, cool. What's the name again? Matsobane. Matsobane, right. Let's take your second question first because we've discussed it already. Okay. You want to know whether uh, parasitism is a form of predation. No. Parasitism, there's no hunting and killing. You see, it's no sense if the parasite mm. kills the, per the, 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 the host. If the host is where the money is, if you want to put it that way. Mm. That's where the juice is. So if the parasite simply just kills the host, it has to find another host. Whereas with the predation, they find us, they hunt, they kill, they eat. Mm. And then they will hunt again. The parasite is going to stay in the host, it's going to use as the, the host as long as possible until that host dies or it is ejected from the host and then find another host. Okay? okay? And the second, your first question rather, what's the difference between a holo parasite and a hemi? Semi. Semi. Right. Some textbooks use the word, so you're saying holo parasite, it's a hyphenated word by the way, and a semi, or some books use the word hemi. Holo coming from the word whole, that means it is completely parasitic. It means it is totally dependent on the host. It can't do anything for itself. Okay? It cannot survive without the host. Whereas a semi or hemi parasite would need certain things. If you did your grade 11 work and you spoke about plants or you talk of bryophytes, for example, you say that the sporophyte is semi-parasitic on the gametophyte because it can do a lot, it, got, it, can, it has chlorophyll, it can make uh, food, but it cannot get water. It needs to take water from the gametophyte. So it's semi-parasitic on the gametophyte, but it's a short lifespan, so it's not going to harm the gametophyte too much. So that's a semi-parasit. Okay, right. and then Gabelum Pashele is asking, hey Luni, please ask Aslam, which essays can I expect in environmental studies? Cabello, darling. Yes. I am not a magician, <laughs> <laughs> nor am I a fortune teller. So I can't tell you what essays, but I have already shown you one type of essay that can be asked. The one we discuss is one way in which the essay. By the way, they can just take uh, symbiosis on its own, discuss mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism with examples and their effect on population alone. There's more than 12 to 15 marks there, and they can add it to something else. They can also take population ecology and ask you to discuss the different factors that affect the size of the population, etc., etc. But your guess is as good as mine. Okay, cool. And then Frank Lamini is asking, Lenny, can you please ask if you have to write everything in the right format or can I write anyhow, but as long as I have all the information, I think this is referring to the essays. What's the name again? Frank Lamini. Frank. Oh, you, you see, your, your question's a bit confusing and you'll ask again later, but from what I'm gathering, you want to know whether you have to write it in the same format as it's written on the board or in a memo. No, you do not have to. First of all, you cannot have the same as the memo. If you did, there's something wrong. You cannot have the same as the memo. That would be an irregularity. That means you would have had access to that memo. So that's not on. But my advice to you is to look at the essay, and generally when they ask you to do something, they ask you in a certain order. Try to keep that order. Why? Because when the memo is written, it will be written in that same order. 
Why is that so good? Because when the marker is marking, then it's easy because it's going to go through. If you mix it up, yes, the marker will have to look for things up and down and to get you the mark. You'll still get your marks, but it's more difficult for the marker, and hence it may escape, certain of your facts may escape the attention of the marker, so it's a disadvantage. We're not saying you have to keep it exactly like that, but try and keep it in that way. Try to deal with one point at a time and move on to the next. Just like in your compositions, in your upstairs, or whatever creative writing you're writing. Take one point, discuss it fully, move to the next in the next paragraph, to the next in the next paragraph. In that way, you, you're giving meaning to what you're writing. All right, last question. Hey, my name is Slundi Wekwaba. Could Aslam please explain the competition again because I really don't understand. Okay, in terms of competition, in terms of competition, we have two types, inter-specific and intra-specific, intra-specific. Inter-specific is between organisms of different species. When we're talking about that, we're talking of organs of different species that are competing. Why would they compete? Because they have similar requirements. They may eat the same thing, different types of bugs. They're different species, but they're eating the same size of plant, etc. So they compete with each other. And intraspecific is competition between, obviously, organisms of the same species. Obviously, if they're the same species, they will definitely have the same requirements because they eat the same thing. Now, how does it affect the population? Obviously, one, pop one species or one organism, the population may decrease because it is not as strong as the other one. The one that is stronger will survive and therefore it will reproduce more. So that population will go up and the other one will go down. Okay? Is that the last one? Last, last, last. Okay, two, one. two more. Two you got the lastest one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is the main purpose of K and R strategy? This is from Lishiva Angel. Lishiva. Yes. K and R strategy. The K R strategy. The, there's no main purpose of them. It's just different types of organisms and how they behave. Okay. One is there's parental care, and with parental care, there's a higher chance of survival. Therefore, there's no need to have many offspring because the ones that are born or hatch or whatever are taken care of so they will survive. In our strategy, this is not the case, therefore they produce many offspring. Why? At least some of them survive. Okay. And the last one? And the last, last, last one. Ken Zani Leto was asking, will I be penalized if I write an essay in point form? No. As long as your points are not so brief that they do not make sense. Each point must make sense. If you want to see, have a look, and all these memos are available online, and on the Mindset website, and on the DBE website, find a memo and see how the essay is set out. They are also given in point form ne where necessary, but each point must stand on its own. Is that the lastest one? Yes. Good. <laughs> if we have more, you can post. If we have time, we'll come back. Okay. All right, we're moving to primary succession now. In this case here, there was no life there. And so we're taking bare rock, for example, there's a bare rock. What happens is small organisms like mosses and lichens, they grow on top of the rock. Why? Because they do not have big soil requirements. They can grow in, in a very small place. You look around your gardens and paving and so on, you can see mosses and lichens. They grow on the paving, they grow on the brick, they grow on the wall, etc. And what do they do is they start breaking up the rock into soil. As that happens, over time, the soil develops, and then small, uh, larger organisms like grasses will grow there as well. The soil then thickens further because these organisms make it even better, and you get your shrubs growing there. And then your trees may grow there. That's a, 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 a pictorial representation. In nature, this is what happens. And I do not have to go through the whole thing again. That's where we started with the lichens and so on, grasses and shrubs and young forests. And then you have, at the end, you're having this forest that is what we call the climax. These organisms here are called pioneer species. Pioneer, why? Because they were the first to inhabit the area. Climax, it has reached maturity. 
That means this ecosystem is now more or less complete. Remember, obviously, as the plants develop, we're not only talking about succession in plants, but as the plants develop, the animals accompany that because here, we can't get lions coming here because what are the lions going to eat here? Or the buck, they can't eat these lichens and get happy. It's too little for them. So they won't survive here, but small insects, etc., will survive here. And then as it progresses, the, the animals also become bigger and more diverse. So in other words, we move from less biodiversity to a greater biodiversity when they reach climax. That's what we are talking about there. It's very simple. Do not complicate it. That's all you need to know in terms of that. So what are the steps that we are talking about? First of all, the exposed rock is colonized by these pioneer organisms. Repeated cycles of growth, death, and regrowth cause establishment of soil, favoring colonization by larger shrubs and annuals, etc. The annuals lead to colonizing by softwood, leading eventually to hardwood. In fact, you do not have to know the specifics of hardwood, softwood, and so on. We're talking about progression in the size of the organism that will be supported by that environment. And obviously, and here you can't see so much, but different animals will then follow in this chain of events that we are talking about. So what is secondary succession? Secondary succession, there we told you that this, this was not inhabited before. Secondary succession occurs when there was a, the habitat had organisms living there and some natural disaster or other has caused the habitat to lose those organisms. And there, from there, it starts again. So here, it's not like starting afresh. They don't have to restart this whole thing. They don't have to stop. The soil is still there. The soil doesn't burn up. So we do not have to make soil from rocks. And the roots of certain plants may have already been there, and they start growing as well. So this is what we are talking about. And here, they're showing you very nicely. There was a forest, complete forest. A fire comes and destroys this forest. And over time, it regenerates itself to get back to where we were in one. If you look at the picture one and the picture eight, it's the same. An example, a stable deciduous forest, any forest for that matter. What happens? Wildfire destroys the forest. What happens because of that? The fire burns to the ground, nothing left there. Grasses and other herbaceous first grow. Because they have less requirements, they will grow fast. Their roots were there, they grew quickly. Small bushes and trees begin to colonize the area, or they regrow if their roots were strong enough and they survive. Fast-growing evergreen trees develop to their fullest, while shade-tolerant trees develop in the understory, under that as well. The short-lived shade trees and inter whatever, the ecosystem is now back to a similar state where it started. And in a real situation, this is what we are talking about. There's the fire destroying all that. You're going to get your pioneer species coming again there, and look at it, it's going from there. Look, I'm going to show you something there. Look at what's happening to the side. Look at what's happening to the side. Can you see? It's going up there. It's catering for bigger plants as we go on. And obviously, with bigger plants will come bigger animals. But secondary succession is usually much quicker than primary succession. Why? Because the soil was there. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel. OK? So that's there already. There's already an existing seed bank of suitable plants in the soil. The seeds were already in the soil. Some of the roots may also remain there. Root systems are undisturbed in the soil. Stumps and other plants from previously existing plants can rapidly regenerate. The fertility and structure of the soil has also been substantially modified by previous organisms. So it's already soil, it's fertile, and the rest of it. So you need to know the difference between primary succession and secondary succession and why the one grows faster than the other. Here's a question taken from Eastern Cape Paper 2, question 1.4. It says, succession is a series of environmental changes that occur in all ecosystems. In the diagram below, an ecosystem has passed through four stages. Study the diagram and answer the questions that follow. So they're giving you pond A, pond B, pond C, pond D. The first question says, write down the letters of the ponds in order from the youngest pioneer com uh, community to the oldest. So obviously, you're going to look for the one that has the least number of organisms, and that will be number one, will be B. 
Coming from that, a little bit more will be C. That's number two. And then A. And lastly, D. I wrote D. Uh, there should be three. And that's number four. So your answer would be B, C, A, D. Some amphibians and crayfish can withstand periods of dryness by burying themselves in mud. In which ponds would they survive? Is there any mud here or soil? No, they can't survive there. So they can survive here, there's very little. So it's point, pond A and point, pond D. Pond A and D. Black bass and bluegill, these are fish, make their nests on sandy bottoms. In which would you find them? In sandy bottoms, you'll get A, you'll get C and D. All three there, A, C, and D. So in other words, you didn't need to know rocket science to answer this question. You need to look at the diagrams and answer it. Do the above diagrams illustrate primary or secondary succession? Let's go back. You can see initially there was nothing happening there. There was no soil, etc., etc. There's some rocks, and later they became soil. So this would be primary succession. These are the types of questions that you can be asked. Let's look at another one. Study the diagram and answer the questions. Here's something that we saw earlier, something happening there. Describe and briefly explain the expected changes in the biodiversity as the stages of succession progresses across there. Very simply put, we start by saying why this is happening, explanation of why biodiversity increased. First of all, biodiversity increases. We must first say that. If you look at the diagram, there were less organisms here, and as we go further, there's more organisms, so biodiversity increases. Then we must explain why it increases, or why there's changes, and what are you doing? You are simply going through the stages from pioneer to climax as we're going across that way, going down further, and so on, and as we're going through. We can't read all the answers there, but the idea is to describe what is happening as one moves through succession. Question four, the diagram below shows stages in a succession from a lake to an oak wood. Yeah. What is the name used to describe the final stage in a succession such as this? Obvious, climax. The aquatic plants in the reeds both contribute to the formation of soil. Suggest how they do this. It's obvious, the soil that is carried by moving water is trapped between the reeds and the aquatic plants, and therefore they stay there. And because of that, the humus, the underground stems, root, stabilize the soil, and on death, they add humus, etc. Guys, that was a great show. I'm hoping you enjoyed it as much as I did. And with that, I hand you to my favorite loony. <laughs> thank you so much, Aslam, for giving us this great lesson. Mindsetters, thank you for your questions. And thank you for all the support and everything else. Thank you to Macmillan wow. for giving us the show. Until next time, it's a goodbye from us. <laughs>